Yeah, uh, I think it's still morning. Good morning, everybody. I am here to present this paper, which is a little bit different from a, uh, yeah, from a little to be different perspective from what people have been saying about infrastructure. I have a finance background, and I'm going to approach it from a finance uh, point of view. Uh, I will not bother you much with the introductory aspect. We all know what I've been in the news, what has been in journals and everything. But uh, where I'm actually going is that uh, over the years, we've had a lot of literature and work done on infrastructure development in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. But most of these studies concentrate on mathematical exposition of relationship between one variable and the other. One variable and the other all the time. But uh, very few studies have been done on the relationship between infrastructure and how are we going to finance that infrastructure. We always have this assumption that once the opportunity or the potential to make money is there, infrastructure will attract finance automatically. But this has not been the case. We've had a lot of studies showing how important it is, but despite that, we are still backward in infrastructure development. So that is why this study is approaching the topic from a different perspective. We want to look at how can we finance infrastructure? What are the options do we have for financing them? What are the implications of these options? And what needs to be done or be changed so that we can have this, uh, we can have this much needed infrastructure? Now, the motivation for this study is just what I just said now. But the major thing is, uh, let's go, let me show you a little bit of what the infrastructure facilities look like in, Afri in West Africa today. Uh, as of this moment, just about 10% of the GDP, uh, as of this moment, investment as a proportion of GDP is just about 10% compared to 60% of other developing countries. Less than 50% less than 50 of roads in the region are paved compared to other areas, about 40% of the population of the region lack access to safe portable water and some other things like that. But these are all things that we often, we've all known for the past. But the major thing we are doing here today is uh, we want to look at how are we going to finance this infrastructure and uh, like just I've said, what are the implications of financing them? Now, I'm just, I just, these are things we all know. First, so it's a, uh, there's a literature review. What are the, uh, what are the issues being tackled in literature review? Literature review, basically, there are two things, there are about two or three things being called, uh, tackled in literature review. One is, is infrastructure actually adding to output? Well, a set of literature says it's adding to output. Some say, well, it's adding to output. It's not that important compared to what people are saying about it. But, the concession here is that whether it's adding much or it's adding little, there's a need for infrastructure for industrial takeoff in the society. That's one. Another aspect of literature is looking at uh, what amount or combination of infrastructure is important and at what level should the society or an economy reduce the amount of infra infrastructure to get the possible uh, uh, to, get the, uh, to get the highest possible return on investment. Well, some literatures have shown that, uh, well, at a percentage point, at, at a point where the society is making, uh, at a point where the society feels that the proportion of what is coming from manufacturing is about 30% uh, of the GDP or 40% of the GDP, then the this such a society should think of where else to invest and not necessarily pouring money into infrastructure because return on infrastructure will not be as much as is being uh, is being talked about. But now, let me go to what this thing is. This uh, study is actually about. Now, with uh, literature recently shows that uh, between between 1980 and year 2011. Foreign direct uh, foreign capital flow to developing countries as a whole increased from seventy eight million dollars to about one point four trillion dollars. But surprisingly, 
or not surprisingly, only about 20% of this money came to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the poorest of all the regions. Now, why is it that there are opportunities for investment in Sub-Saharan Africa, but the finance is not coming? One of the, one of the factors that have been put in place, one of the factors that, that, that I've been talking about is uh, the unique nature of Sub-Saharan uh, sub African markets. The, the unique nature in the sense that preparation of cap of projects is a little bit, uh, the way they prepare the projects is, doesn't meet international standard uh, because uh, government is pertaining too much and the possibility of making profit is not really, really there. Now, we now want to look at why should government produce or why should not government not produce not get involved in, on, in infrastructure as much. There are some basic infrastructure that are needed in the society, but government producing this all the time brings some problem. For instance, the first consideration is equity consideration. If we look at our society very well, we all gain from infrastructure, but not equally. Some gain more than the others. Some don't even need them. For instance, if we have, uh, if a society has a school, we are all gaining from that society. But if a society has a mall, not everybody goes to that mall to go and buy things. Not everybody goes there, not everybody goes there to, sell, uh, to sell commodities. So it would be better for those that are gaining from the services being rendered by that facility to at least pay something towards the upkeep of the society. If that is done, then there will be what, what we consider to be equity in the way the, 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 the facility is being provided or equity in, uh, in the burden, in the share of the burden of the, of the commodity, of, of the facility. Another thing is alloc allocation efficiency. Oh, uh, literature shows that uh, the way when government gets involved in, uh, uh, in provision of services and infrastructure is always done with less efficiency compared to when the private sector does those things. One of the reasons is bureaucracy. You have to, the papers have to move from one office to the other all the time, waiting for somebody to sign it, waiting for another person to sign it. All these things bring in efficiency. Another thing is the cost of those facilities. In most cases, when government gets involved in projects, the cost of executing the projects is higher than when the private sector gets involved in this. In the project, when the when the, uh, when the private sector pro provides the uh, the facility, now looking at these three considerations, one will agree that it is time for Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular to shift from government provision of facilities all the time to a market base where there will be money to produce those things and there will also be money to maintain them over the years. Because uh, research has shown that the problem of infrastructure in, Afri in, West in sub saharan Africa is not only that of inadequate provision, but inadequate maintenance as well. Some countries have very good structures, very good facilities, but they lack the maintenance culture. Not that they don't know how to maintain it, but they don't even have the money to maintain it because of what it costs. Now, that's, I now go back to what are the unique nature of uh, sub-Saharan African uh, co uh, continent that makes a, a finance that is preventing finance from flowing to that area compared to other regions of the world like Asia and the Americas and part of Europe. The first one is inadequate project, uh, inadequate project preparation, just as I've said earlier. In some cases, we, we realize that uh, Engineering drawings and designs do not even meet present standard uh, requirements. So when investors come and see all these things, they don't get attracted to those, things, to, those, uh, to those projects. And once they are not attracted to projects, they are not ready to finance it. And that thing is, under developed capital markets, most Capital for uh, a lot of capital for investment all over the world now comes from the capital market of those countries. But if you look at the capital market in sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's not as developed as those areas. 
uh, market capitalization is very, very low. That's true. Another thing is that uh, even in those markets where, like in markets like South Africa, which is the, high, the most developed capital market in, in Africa as of today, people don't invest in long-term projects. They are not ready to, to buy a bond that will take a long time to mature. Most bonds they buy, and even the one, most of the ones that South Africa government is issuing now, is about five years, maximum 10 years bond. So the market doesn't have the capacity to come up with the money to finance projects that has long gestation periods. That's what that's in. How is risk of the project? The Sub-Saharan African region, compared to every other region in the world, has specific risk that are not even common to those areas. The first one is political risk. When a project is being designed, there are some factors that are taken into consideration, like return to investor, how investor will repatriate his profits back to his country. But along the line, if the government of the, those countries changes through either coup or anything, a new government can come in and say, you know what? No, you cannot repatriate 60% of your profit anymore. It has to be 30%, take it or leave it. So when a country, when investors see that such factors are very possible in such countries, they get skeptical of investing in those countries. That's one, that's one part of the risk. Other part of the risk is uh, even when there is money, when investors present, when investors uh, bring out the money for this investment, at times there is no demand enough for the services of those projects. And if there's no demand enough, there's what we call uh, financial risk. And if once there's financial risk, or uh, then once there's financial risk and the investor is unable to recruit his money from the project, then there's a problem. Once this possibility is there, investors get scared of investing in this kind of project. Now, let's start, what are the, given all these factors, what are the options that the sub saharan African countries have for investing? Now, previously before this time, a lot of, um, most of the capital invested in infrastructure development comes from single banks, like the First Banks, the Barclays Bank, and some other banks around. But the present demand for infrastructure goes beyond the capital those single banks can provide. There's a need for what we call uh, public sector subordinated notes. In this case, the federal government or the government of the country will provide something like a loan to investors to invest in those projects. When they, when they give those loans, the loan yields return to the government. And the investor also make money. The investor is, is a, a, has a rest of mind that at least it's not the only one bearing the burden of the project. The government is also sharing the burden. If the government is sharing the burden, then it feels that, well, the burden of the project on him is limited. And the government might not even want the money to just go down the drain like that. The government will always come out with, come out with policies to support those projects. Another one is a public sector minimum guarantee. Some projects don't have enough uh, enough demand for their services. For instance, now, like somebody just mentioned uh, stadiums in Africa now. If, some, if an investor had invested about uh, $20 million on a stadium, and just maybe that stadium hosts about five, 10 football matches in a year, that means the investor will not be able to recoup his, uh, his money from such investment. But if the government can say, you know what? We guarantee you a minimum of $2 million worth of uh, uh, business every year on your investment. The such investors, okay, $2 million in a year, maybe in about 20 years, I can recoup my money back. That's fine. He will not feel too bad investing in that, those kind of business. It will, the investors will always be interested in investing in those kind of business. And that is public sector debt. Uh, uh, another thing is a uh, public sector debit capital. Here, the government gives loan to investors, just like commercial banks gives loan to them. 
And this loan will be given just as that the, the term of interest on those loans is just as the term of interest on commercial loans. The government is not partaking in the uh, running of the, of the business, but all the government was doing is just to make sure that uh, the, the, the public sector are encouraged to invest in those business. The public sector feels saved, and the government also makes money from this kind of investment. Another way we can look at this is what we call tax incremental finance. Tax incremental finance is uh, a system where in facilities in areas where government provides public uh, provides in, in infrastructure, those people are people living around those facilities have some gains that people living beyond the facilities don't have. For instance, the location of a train station close to a community increase the value of property in those areas. And if those people are gaining from the, those kind of location, it is normal for them to be able to part away with some of the profits that comes to them, not as a result of the fact that maybe they are making business, but because of the fact that they are luckily located close to the project. If, for instance, the, house, the value of houses goes up, if, for instance, the value of houses goes up by maybe about 10%, government can make loans. You say what? If property goes up by 10% in this location between this period, 5% of those uh, of the uh, of the value increment will be taxed that government will collect back from the people. There are some places in uh, in Europe that have done that, especially uh, especially in uh, Austria, they've done those things. And that thing is infrastructure development corporation. He, this system, the government established like a corporate entity that is saddled with responsibility of developing those infrastructures. Any big infrastructure the government wants to do, those companies does it, make money for the government, and private sectors can also invest in such kind of a business. Uh, now, let's, uh, I want to quickly look at uh, uh, the sources of finance. As, as I've mentioned earlier, we have syndicated bank loans, banks coming together to provide large amount of finance. And that one is, uh, is uh, institutional investors bring money to, buy, to finance infrastructural projects. But the problem with these institutional investors is that in sub-Saharan Africa, the institutional investors are not well developed compared to some other areas. So there is need for government to see how this uh, kind of institution can be developed more than they are today. The major one is capital markets. The capital market is a major source of capital for investment. But the way it is in South Africa today, because of the low capital base, they cannot do this as much. But to get, uh, one of the advantages that can come out of the capital market is the bond market. But for the bond market to work, there is a need for the countries to have uh, a credit rating for the country and to make sure that what uh, the project they are about to finance is also rated. That's the major two problem with this. Uh, just one minute. Uh, now, let me quickly go to the conclusion. From what, from our research, we realized that uh, without moving towards a business oriented or a business approach to infrastructure development, it's going to be very, very difficult to get infrastructures developed in South Africa because the revenue available to the government is not increasing as the demand on government services and uh, projects are increasing. So there's a, new, there's a need for the private sector to come in and kind of augment infrastructure services and facilities in this site. Another, one, uh, another thing we, want to, uh, we mentioned in our conclusion is the fact that there is going to be higher competition for investable funds all over the world. As time goes on, it's happening now, it's going to get tougher. The only way Africa can, South Africa can gain from this is to make sure that uh, we have the, the, uh, the, service, the, the, the conditions necessary to attract foreign investors into, the, into our country, uh, or to the region generally. Without this, it's going to be a little bit difficult for government alone to provide the services 
we are we all needed because uh, the rate at which government revenue is increasing is really, really low compared to the rate at which population and demand for infrastructure is increasing all over uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much.